you're pushing the next Google, the next Microsoft somewhere else. And founders have been moving, particularly in the Web3 space, have been moving away from the US and into other places, specifically because there's so much regulatory uncertainty. It's not that the founders themselves are necessarily panicked about the uncertainty. It's that the investment community finds it difficult. A lot of the investment funds are flowing into things that seem much safer. So generative AI, large language models, and away mm -hmm. from things that, that use the word token and tokenization and crypto. The intersection of those two is vastly important, and the projects that span those are going to be the next killer apps. Smart regulation is paramount. It's the bedrock for capital formation. Welcome to season two of From the Blockchain, where we speak to today's most innovative entrepreneurs and thought leaders to unpack the true potential of smart contract technology, Web3, and the digital frontier. I'm your host, Ashley Smith from Fame Lady Squad, and I'm thrilled to have you join today's top tier community of forward thinking trailblazers. We're here to foster a culture of idea sharing, creativity and innovation that transcends industries, revolutionizes business, and drives meaningful conversation. If you're ready to forge a path to becoming a thought leader in your industry or organization, think of this podcast as your compass. Don't forget to subscribe, share, and be part of our amazing community. Oh, and please note that this podcast is for informational entertainment purposes only and should not be considered financial or investment advice. All righty, everybody, enjoy the show. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to From the Blockchain. I am very excited about today's episode. I have a very special guest. Um, I'm hoping to dive into some topics related to blockchain technology that we haven't quite touched on, at least not in any deep way yet. Uh, we're going to be talking about policy, governance, um, the framework for how co uh, countries should be looking at some of this technology and also the intersection with artificial intelligence. So my guest today is Benjamin Yablon. I'm going to give a little bit of a background so you all know the incredible work that he's been doing. Benjamin is the founder of Orbu.ai, a platform leveraging collective intelligence, Web3 and AI for better financial predictions. He co-founded founded Salt Blockchain, the world's first crypto lending platform in 2016. In 2017, he moved from the US uh, with his family to Africa and later to London to create Salt's global architecture. He serves as special advisor to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, also known as the OECD, which is probably the acronym we'll be using when we refer to that in today's discussion. So that's the OECD, where he helps craft global regulatory policy specific to the sensible deployment of financial and other technologies, including blockchain, distributed ledger, machine learning, and AI. He has participated as an expert speaker at the OECD's headquarters in Paris dozens of times and has provided expert insights at global NGO events in dozens of countries. In 2019, Benjamin was appointed by the OECD to serve on the Blockchain Expert Policy Advisory Board. The priority of this board is the development of a policy framework for governments and industry on viable innovation and adoption of distributed ledger technologies similar to the principles of artificial intelligence, which were supported by all G20 members in June 2019. Benjamin spent his early career as a practicing attorney focused on emerging financial technology platforms and regulatory compliance. No big deal. Welcome, Benjamin, to From the Blockchain. Thank you so much for being here. How are you doing today? Uh, doing very well. Thanks for having me, Ashley. It's a pleasure. Hey, I really appreciate it. I mean, you are working on a lot of things. You're publishing a lot of different articles, um, really a thought leader in this space, and also looking at artificial intelligence and some of the um, solutions that these two technologies can bring to complex challenges. I would love to know, um, before we dive in, maybe a little bit about your why. Why are you working on these things? Why does it matter to you? Oh, great question. So my my fascination with AI goes back to uh, the early 2000s when I read a book by Ray Kurzweil called The Singularity is Near. So a lot of people in AI have read this book and it, it foretells uh, the the coming uh, nexus of humanity with machines, et cetera. It's, it's a fascinating read. I recommend anybody check it out. Um, and I was never really able to look away from tech after that. I was a practicing attorney, um, but 
obsessed with all things AI uh, until I ran into uh, blockchain in its earliest days. So around 2011 and 2012, I was a practicing attorney uh, doing a lot of work in insolvency. So bankruptcy cases for, for businesses and individuals. Mm -hmm. And as part of that process, people were being stripped of their assets. So bank accounts are frozen, wages are garnished, properties are leaned, on and on and on. Uh, and along comes this, this concept of sovereign digital property. So the, the idea of these digital assets that were self-possessory was incredibly compelling. And so the idea of Bitcoin, obviously, the, the, the first and some would argue the only valid use case of blockchain to date uh, is, is one element of that. But, but everything we touch is digital and the implications of, of having sovereignty over everything we touch that's digital uh, really resonated and I was never able to look away. So that the, the why is that it became an obsession. And uh, aside from the birth of my children, the happiest day of my marriage was when I found a Bitcoin meetup group in Denver. So I could stop talking exclusively to my wife about how neat this tech was and could and could have some other like minded people uh, to to share the the possibilities with. And that ultimately led to the founding of Salt, which was mm -hmm. Uh, the first company to lend against Bitcoin using it as collateral. Salt is still around as doing some really interesting things. Um, others in that framework have uh, have met uh, ignominious uh, ends, and it's been a, a wild ride in in crypto margin lending. But full disclosure, I'm a lawyer, so I'm I'm perfectly happy to to talk nonstop, <laughs> Ashley. So break it up. <laughs> well, I, I do feel there's value for our audience to. Um maybe have some deeper context of some of that previous or not previous, but earlier work that kind of set the stage for some of the things that you're doing today. Um, can you tell us just simple terms, what it means to be borrowing against digital assets? Yeah. So it's the, the, the closest uh, similar uh, process would be using a stock portfolio uh, as security for uh, a loan uh, denominated in fiat. So instead of putting your Apple stock up and getting a loan in dollars, you would use your Bitcoin, ETH, or, or some blend of digital assets as collateral and, uh, and get a loan against those assets. And, and this proved to be a very popular idea because people that believe in Bitcoin believe that it's going to continue to rise in value. And so their, their worst nightmare is having to be a forced seller. What they want to do is hodl. Uh, and life can make that impossible. Salt was a solution and crypto lending is a solution for the long-term holders uh, to be able to preserve their asset, pay uh, a smaller interest rate uh, than, than the inflation and the, the rise of value that they would see in the underlying asset. So mm -hmm. very simple model, but <laughs> and anything that seems simple often isn't. And as we saw with other crypto lenders, uh, a, a lot of other um, features were injected into that model that uh, resulted in sort of catastrophic failures. Uh, and we're still dealing with the the fallout from several of those. So first, just for our audience sake, HODL means hold on for dear life. So that's just a popular acronym that's used. But I think more importantly, uh, I'm assuming this really introduced you, especially as a lawyer and the legal having a legal background, but to that the significance of the regulatory framework and why it matters and the dangers of maybe um, for the public putting their money into platforms or using platforms where there may be not as many safeguards. Is that true? Definitely. And the early experience with SALT uh, led to many conversations with regulators, some of them good and some of them very bad. Uh, and that that was a big piece of why, as an attorney, I, I felt really strongly that I had uh, some some important things uh, to try to share directly with the regulatory community to help them make sense out of what real dangers were uh, and and what what they were over prioritizing that, that wasn't a, a problem. So, you know, when you're dealing with a, a regulator that has never held crypto and, and doesn't doesn't like it doesn't want anything to do with it, but is in charge of it, you, you have this mismatch of, of incentives. So helping regulators understand which elements of, 
the technology uh, and, and crypto assets were genuinely non-threatening and innovative and important and, and could actually empower uh, the whole swaths of the world became very important to me. And that, and then I was fortunate to have been so early in this to then get pulled into some of these, these other high level conversations like uh, the OECD's blockchain initiative and others. So can you tell me a little bit more about the OECD first for anyone who's listening, that's never heard of the OECD, the organization for economic cooperation and development, who are they and what is their mandate? This is my favorite thing people ask me. So um, I, I'm an American, obviously, um, and I hadn't heard of the OECD until I was traveling abroad. And, and you know, a student of history, but you know, I, I know a lot about World War II and and the rest. Um, and an understanding of why the OECD exists ties directly to World War II and the destruction of Europe. So after World War II, Europe is effectively in shambles. Uh, and the U.S. Uh, deploys the Marshall Plan, and the OECD was created to administer the Marshall Plan, and that's the rebuilding of Europe's infrastructure. So the Organization for Economic Development and Cooperation, uh, headquartered in Paris, uh, it was responsible for the connection, the connective tissue of all things economic in the rebuilding of Europe with uh, very close ties to the U.S., so the OECD is actually quite big. It has 13 different directorates that span everything from uh, science and technology to insurance markets, financial markets, et cetera. Uh, it includes something called the FATF, which is uh, independent, but sits within the OECD and is a, is a very important policymaking organization that basically sets uh, counter terror and money laundering policy. So, so very important initiatives come out of FATF. Um, and, and the OECD generally is an economic think tank. The, the best way to think of it is as a macroeconomic think tank. Can you give us an overview of the type of work that the OECD is doing now then with blockchain technology uh, at the forefront? Yeah, definitely. So any emerging technology or market conversation, they're, they're very active in, in conversations around Africa, et cetera. Uh, the, the OECD serves a very important convening role. So it's not the United Nations. It's not the G7, which is very, uh, very small. It includes members of both, but it's primarily a, a group of Western countries that, that are involved at the OECD level. And what they have is massive convening abilities to bring multi-stakeholder parties together from government, private sector, et cetera, uh, and moderate these discussions and, and come out of them with policy recommendations. And those can either be adopted or not by respective governments, but they're often uh, the, the early signs of where a, a particular piece of technology or uh, regulatory initiative will head. So it's, it's early in the conversation. It's, it's similar in some ways to what goes on at the World Economic Forum at Davos, but with a much broader mandate. So mm -hmm. it's, similar in some ways uh, to, to some of the policy initiatives that we see from groups like WEF, but actually much, much broader in terms of the scope and scale of, of what the OECD's mandate looks like. I did um, have a look at some of the articles that you and Cyrus Hodas have put out together. I'll make sure to link them in the show notes for people to reference. Um, there's a lot of interesting takeaways from these articles. And, you know, you talk a lot about, of course, um, decentralized ledger, blockchain technology, as well as artificial intelligence. One of the, I think, things that is easy for people to understand and digest are quotes like, it is important to note that the speed at which both these technologies are being developed and deployed far outpace what legislators and regulators can tackle. Uh, can, can you add to that a little bit? Like, what are you seeing? How are you finding um, just the sort of reaction response from regulators and legislators and i think it it's very much in the public discourse right now related to artificial intelligence i think even in the public realm people have a better understanding at least in their own minds they have some understanding of what the tech might be able to do and have fears around that when it comes to blockchain technology i think most many folks don't even really understand 
that the tech exists. <laughs> so sure. anything you can speak to related to that and how, um, like, how do we deal with this? How do we deal with regulators and, and governments um, doing things that make sense in a time when everything's moving so fast? You know, I, I actually, I had an interview with CZ uh, from yes. Binance uh, a few months back where we talked about this very thing. And so to, to quote him, small jurisdictions are able to be really nimble and, and make decisions quickly uh, with respect to innovation trends. Large jurisdictions, China, the US, uh, struggle with that. And particularly in the US, we're dealing with a highly politicized process now. So whether the ideas are good or not is somewhat secondary to whether or not uh, there's some some political motivation around uh, backing it or not backing uh, an initiative. And, and what that's resulted in, particularly in the US, is a completely fragmented uh, regulatory environment where innovation has been uh, slowed and has been pushed into other jurisdictions. So, you know, the EU has, has done some very interesting things. The UK has done some incredibly interesting things uh, to, to begin to bring uh, projects that, are, that can't find a home in the US and, and are, are looking for uh, good jurisdictions in terms of uh, a, a fair-minded, robust judiciary uh, with a well-understood case law, et cetera. So, so rule, where there's really rule of law, where you're, where you're gonna be really happy that your IP sits in that jurisdiction in the case you need to defend it. Mm -hmm. Then there's some other smaller jurisdictions, Mauritius in particular, Bermuda in particular, that have done brilliant things from a regulatory perspective. They've been, they, they've been at the OECD, they've been at the WEF, uh, but they're, but they're also, you know, they're not, they're not being led by the larger jurisdictions. They're listening to what the problems are. They're, they're looking at the actual threats, uh, the, the actual systemic risks, and then crafting legislation and getting it pushed through. So Bermuda in, in particular uh, is, is really on the forefront of making in incredibly uh, important moves in banking. So as we saw in the US, there, there were multiple failures of crypto specific banks, uh, SVB, um, Silvergate, on and on. Uh, Bermuda has, has watched those things uh, and is still charging forward and making sense out of a sensible regulatory regime to allow uh, digitally native banks to exist and to service customers. And, and they're going to be big winners. I, I, I strongly believe that there's still an enormous story to be told uh, around digital assets as a, you know, as, as a native form of value. So just a, there, there's a lot left uh, in the tank for the story of crypto. We're coming up on the halving of Bitcoin next year. There's a lot of speculation about what the price is going to look like. I, I love those discussions, although I'm not I'm not one to take positions one way or the other. I, I really am fascinated by and and study the psychology of of what these market iterations mean. That's that's a big piece of the tool I'm building, which is uh, this this hybrid prediction market uh, with uh, an AI backend to understand the the swarm intelligence of the group to to make sense out of what what's coming next. Mm -hmm. So I spend a lot of time obsessing about the future, but not a lot of time making bets on it. It's, it's sort of the selling shovels to miners uh, conversation. That being said, I do wonder um, just about the, the general public, let's say business leaders, government leaders, um, industry leaders, folks who have a vested interest in the success of whatever it is that they're working on. First of all, should they care about the technology? Um, and should they care about how fast or slow their government comes together to create parameters for them related to this? Like what is the risk, generally speaking, if the community, the public community aren't given parameters? Like, mm -hmm. Is there fear being left behind? Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, you think about the, the largest tech companies that are US based those are enormous economic drivers. But the innovation that's happening now is around the, the Web3 technology set. I, I don't even know if people say Web3 now. Um, uh, we do sometimes. Blockchain and DLT on the one hand, uh, AI and machine learning on the other, the intersection 
of those are are the next unbelievably important companies. We see that with OpenAI. Uh, we see large incumbents uh, producing other really compelling AI solutions. You know, Google's Bard, very compelling stuff. Um, and Cyrus, when when he joins us next, we'll get into granular detail on AIGC chain, uh, which I think is very well poised uh, to to be in the discussion for how these systems should be built and why. Mm -hmm. But the, the fear is just you're pushing the next Google, the next Microsoft, the next X somewhere else. And that's mm -hmm. that's a real phenomenon. And founders have been moving, particularly in the Web3 space, have been moving away from the US and into other places uh, for the last few years, specifically because there's so much regulatory uncertainty. and mm -hmm. and. It's not that the founders themselves are necessarily panicked about the uncertainty. It's that the the investment community uh, finds it difficult, I think, to to pick uh, safe places to to make those bets. So they're you know they a, a lot of the the investment funds are flowing into things that seem much safer. So generative AI, large language models, etc., and away mm -hmm. from things that that use the word token and tokenization and crypto. At the moment mm -hmm. and those the intersection of those two is vastly important and the projects that span those are going to be the next killer apps and as a result of sort of the the regulatory terror that we see in in places like the us those projects are finding homes in other places like europe so mm -hmm. uh what i think it was uh a16 uh just set up in london so you know andreessen horowitz just opened an office here, Rishi Snack was ecstatic. You know, there, there's a lot of movement actually going on in terms of the investment community looking for a home where they're where they're going to have a safe, stable regulatory environment uh, and innovators coming in. So that's that's a long, long way of saying smart regulation uh, is paramount. That's it, it's it's the bedrock for capital formation. So um, just note to our audience, we do hope to speak with Cyrus Hoda's, Benjamin's partner, and dive a little bit deeper into some AI soon. So uh, watch for that upcoming episode. It's worth noting, so we're recording on September 26th. Yesterday, Amazon in made a huge investment in AI, uh, committing up to $4 billion in Anthropic. So that's, I mean, there's, these things are happening. Um, yeah. I do feel like <laughs> it's, it's, it feels very obvious right now that people are wanting to invest in AI, but there's still a lot of fear around it. But with the blockchain technology stuff, I think there's just been such a narrative around cryptocurrency, market speculation, and people kind of think it's all dead. Um, but I want to speak to like th the response you just gave to me um, makes a lot of sense. But I also feel like it's touching on, you know, um, new enterprise, new technology, startup culture, business um, opportunities. But I know that a lot of this technology can have such a huge impact on resources uh, and services and things that day-to-day -day people that may not care necessarily about the technology, but it might benefit them. Um, mm -hmm. You and Cyrus put uh, out a really great piece on healthcare as an example, and yeah. discussed the uh, sort of use case for blockchain technology and AI uh, working kind of together. Um, you mentioned that these two technologies are frequently underestimated as a harmonious technological duo. Um, and, and wrote about this in the context of healthcare. Maybe we can touch a little bit on where you see the opportunities in that space. I will mention that we've we've talked about healthcare on the show, but in very superficially. Um, we've had a few folks say that they feel that's an area for a lot of innovation, but we haven't really discussed what that innovation could look like. So I'd love for you to uh, give our audience some insights as to what you see um, as the possibilities and what's actually happening out there. So there, there's a lot there. So the the impact of AI on healthcare is is one track and the impact of blockchain on the underlying data sets uh, that make up our, our, uh, our healthcare system is another, but they do interrelate. So to I'll, I'll start with blockchain. Uh, DLT. Um, may we may we just tell the audience what DLT is? Sure. 
Um, so, so DLT is distributed ledger technology. That's an umbrella term, uh, which includes blockchain. And there mm -hmm. are there are different ways uh, to arrive at consensus. Uh, blockchain is one of them, uh, but distributed ledger technologies include things like hash graphs, uh, which is another way of reaching consensus that is uh, in some ways much, much faster than a blockchain and actually requires a lot less energy. So I know this is another uh, area you want to you want to get into in terms of the energy usage around crypto, etc. Mm -hmm. So under the umbrella of DLT, healthcare uh, specifically can be an enormous beneficiary. So if you think about how cumbersome it can be to move health data from one point to another, um, you already know that something's wrong with that system. Distributed ledgers are a perfect way to both preserve the anonymity and or confidentiality around people's, people's medical data while opening up that medical data to a much larger uh, group of people that are interested in it. So it, it opens up several possibilities. The first being just the portability of your data, being able to move medical data from A to B. Uh, the, the second would be the ability to permission who sees that data. So DLT allows for, for things like strong permissioning. Uh, next, you, you get into issues uh, of who that data is valuable to. And on the, the, the last report I read said that on the black market, medical records are uh, the most valuable thing people buy. So mm -hmm. there's a reason that, that we have these siloed systems with heavy duty security around them. The pe hackers uh, and nefarious folks have a significant interest in getting access to medical data specifically. Can I ask just as to why that might be? There are a lot of reasons for it. Um, but in, in terms of being able to uh, steal an identity, that, that's, that's a significant component. Uh, and, and then there are marketplaces for uh, that kind of health data. So understanding, uh, and, and not all of these uses are nefarious, let me be clear. So if you're a research hospital and, and you need uh, to study a very specific disease, you are highly limited in terms of uh, the, the sample sets that you can access at the moment. If we were on a, a distributed system where those, uh, those institutions were able to both access and pay for that data, that, that would be an enormous monetization of patient data that would be beneficial to the patients. As it stands, and instead what we have is a situation where medical data is, data is highly siloed and dependent upon the provider, uh, and the research hospitals with relationships with that provider are, are able to do their clinical trials. They do not compensate the patient for the use of that data. They compensate the data owner, in this case, uh, the, uh, the provider. So if we were to flip that around, if you owned your health data in the same way that you own your NFT, your board Becky, uh, imagine the power of that. So if there was some genetic uh, condition that uh, a research hospital were studying, they could see that you had a marker for it. They could hypothetically transact with you for that, uh, that data set, all while preserving the security and anonymity of the underlying patient. So the implications of what DLT does uh, and, and blockchain are enormous outside of the movement of, of crypto assets. And, and the public gets uh, myopically focused on, on crypto as the use case. It's a use case. There, there are a number of ways that this tech will benefit humanity. And it, we get into a strange territory where it's like uh, in 1999, the, the HTTP protocol, I think it was 99, uh, was revolutionary. And everybody was talking about HTTP. But you fast forward, you know, five to eight years later, nobody talks about HTTP. I think blockchain will be the same, honestly, that it, it's going to be integrated in as a security layer into everything we touch. And we won't talk about it as, uh, as blockchain or DLT per se. It, it will be, uh, part of the security layer uh, of our digital interactions. I really appreciate um, that overview. I think that a lot of the times in this type of conversation, we talk about owning your data, and I'm not sure it's always so clear as to what that means. And I do think that this gives a very um, specific and digestible 
uh, example of how you really can own your data and choose how that data is um, used. Uh, I do wonder, are, are, is this right now just a concept? Like, are there, are there organizations actually working actively on implementing this type of technology in this way? Like, do we see um, hospitals or, or like who would be creating that sort of framework? It would probably maybe not be coming from within the health space, but like private. I don't know. I, I, maybe that's a silly question. I've I guess been an would... advisor to yeah. a company called Burst IQ since mm -hmm. 2015. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I first ran across Burst IQ um, during Denver Startup Week. And, and one of their executives was talking about what it was they were doing with health data. And it absolutely blew my mind. So I'd, I'd been in these meetup groups uh, talking about crypto and the possibilities of what uh, the technology would enable. And all of a sudden, in 2015, I was listening to a group talking about what they were actively doing with health data on chain. Mm -hmm. And it blew my mind and I've been involved with them ever since. So I think the best use case I would point to is definitely what Burst IQ has done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and they're, the, the way to think of them is more of the, the bridges and tunnels uh, connecting the siloed uh, data repositories between large provider groups. Now, you, you absolutely hit on a, on a crucial point, which is why isn't this being driven internally by the healthcare providers? And, and I think there's a cynical answer to that, which is it, it's not nearly as valuable to them to make the patient the net beneficiary of their health information, it's incredibly valuable to be the fiduciary of that, that health data repository and to, to sell that, to, to use that to synthesize new uh, treatments and, and therapeutics and sell those on. So there's, but, but in a lot of ways, we're seeing this transformation happen, whether the big providers wanted to or not, uh, there's still uh, this this phenomenon of code eating the world. And when there are better, cheaper, faster solutions, they win out. So in, in a properly functioning market, we see the better solutions coming online and, and Burst is, hit, is having steady growth year on year mm -hmm. and has really developed some of the most compelling tech in the space. And it, and it leads to one other vastly important point, maybe the most powerful aspect of, of distributed ledger generally uh, which is identity and the ability to create uh, a self-sovereign identity, one that is not specifically reliant upon a government agency to issue it. So instead of a driver's license, you would have this, this idea of an on-chain identity. So not a new concept, far from it. And there, there are lots of examples and, and initiatives pushing this. But Burst has actually gone very far in, in this regard because they have to. In order to make medical data shareable in this way, They've had to create these this credentialing system to, to anchor an individual based not just on a, a government ID, but also on their medical data. And then we can start layering in all sorts of other things as well. So that's mm. a, a massively exciting component of what the tech unlocks and is probably that's that's the trillion dollar company who whomever solves digital identity. The services that flow from that are, are un unbelievable and also maybe terrifying to a lot of people. So we see digital identity in places like China uh, and that can be used as a tool of massive social control and coercion. We don't want that. We, what we want is to be the owners of our data and, and our digital lives. What we do not want is to be coerced by uh, you know, a faceless bureaucracy somewhere else that has its own motives and motivations and agendas, etc. And so because of that pushback, that interplay between the two, I think that's dramatically slowed us down. So the, the promise of the tech is there. The implementation of the tech is not. And, and it's this creative destruction that we watch in the regulatory sphere. And that's, again, a big piece of why I got involved with the OECD and, and you know, along with others like Joe Lubin, uh, were, you know, worked on uh, these blockchain policy principles, which, which are high level, but they're, they're principles based. So there's, there's some compelling things to, to draw out of those policy principles. They're, recommendations, they're not law. So it's still up to the individual uh, member states to actually adopt these things. But the clearest cut use cases, I think, are around things like 
healthcare. I think that uh, the the final thing I would say on the the regulatory side of this global debate is that there's still time to make progress. This isn't settled. There are significant initiatives underway in the U.S. and, and I can be hopeful for favorable results. We've we've seen some court cases uh, that have taken a a much more clinical eye to, to both the government position uh, and industry's position. And, and those are very promising signs and we need to follow through on those. In the meantime, uh, significant progress has been made in places uh, like Bermuda and Mauritius and in the EU specifically. So there, there are some real signs of hope. Uh, there, are, there are problematic elements if you're a, a crypto maxi uh, you know, maybe I'm I'm probably going to anger many people by saying crypto maxi, but that's okay. Fair enough. They, <laughs> it is what it is. Um, the there's always been this interplay between crypto assets, native digital assets, regulators, and banks, and the the banking situation is one of the the key pieces of the puzzle to be solved. And so it, it remains to be seen uh, how an appropriate framework will come into being. You know, I've, mm -hmm. I've had conversations uh, with Caitlin Long, who's uh, the, the CEO and founder of Custodia Bank in Wyoming, who's gone through a long and protracted battle uh, to get access uh, to uh, full, uh, full banking and uh, launch her bank uh, with full federal access even though she's followed all of the rules there. So there's that interplay. And then we see phenomenon like what's going on in places like Bermuda, where you have a, a very cohesive regulatory community with a single set of rules. Uh, and they're, it, Bermuda in particular with its, with its large reinsurance business, it is not at all uh, you know, afraid of uh, engaging with the, the top businesses on the planet. So they're, they're very used to uh, heavy duty compliance, and they see the opportunity in this. And so, there, in a way, we've we've seeded the field as, you know, as an American. I can say that it, we've seen fits and starts for uh, fully integrated crypto banking, and we've taken some steps away from that. Other places have taken steps directly toward it, and I think will be. Uh, big net beneficiaries going forward. I am going to put some information about Burst IQ in the show notes. I did have a look at some of the work that they're doing with LifeGraph, and I actually I found it super interesting. So I think it's even just for people oh, to have a but, better yeah, under the precision medicine. Oh, this is my favorite. Yeah, it's it's really. <laughs> I I don't think we're going to be able to dive super deep further that's into its that. Whole, but that's I, a whole episode. I, I, that's a, a yes. fantastic topic. It, it, I also think it helps people understand, even if they're not necessarily interested in healthcare specifically, but I think it helps give an idea of how these technologies work together. I think it was in that reading where I had a little bit of an aha moment when they refer to permissionless access to data and using smart contracts. And I think for someone like myself, um, and I've been, you know, paying attention to some of this technology for the last few years, but I'm, I'm still so much of a, a lay person when it comes to technology. I'm not a technologist. I have a real estate background. And, you know, when I realized there was an opportunity for me to learn a little bit more about blockchain technology, it was because of that real estate kind of uh, industry sector background. I thought, okay, smart contracts. And I'm thinking about smart contracts in a very literal way. Like, mm -hmm. and, and so this was my aha moment. Uh, the language of smart contracts to me, I'm like, okay. You, you can use these to replace other forms of more archaic, traditional contract systems, um, legal documentation, et cetera. But I think that, and maybe you can help me unpack this just a little bit, but like, I think it, it's just these points of, um, I, I say permission, because if, some, if mm -hmm. someone does A, it might equal B, and then C happens. And so I think that if we can just talk a little bit about in a non-technical way, what a smart contract really is and, and how, for Definitely. example, you can then give access to your data. Um, it might help frame a better understanding of this technology because I think even myself until very recently, I wasn't thinking about it in the right way. Definitely. Um, and I remember uh, thinking a lot about this in the early days as a, as a lawyer and coming to the realization that 
they are neither smart nor contract. What they are <laughs> is a piece of self-executing code. And that's very powerful. So, you know, the, the, the smart contract, the, the highest level way to think of a smart contract is uh, when, when a particular action happens, in this case, think of it in terms of sending ETH into a smart contract, it triggers some other action. And those things are all automated and, and because they're distributed, they're locked in. So, so they, they're no longer uh, voluntary agreements. Once you've committed the terms to this, uh, when, when the uh, gas goes into the smart contract, an, an output happens and, and nothing can stop that output from happening. We can replicate that, uh, particularly using AI, uh, millions of times a minute. And depending on which architecture we're talking about, that's those are real numbers. So in the Ethereum blockchain, not quite as fast. In something like Hedera uh, and, and the hash graph, that fast. So we can have uh, unbelievable numbers of these self-executing transactions happening. That becomes incredibly powerful when we're, we're dealing with things like the sharing of medical data, the sharing uh, of any biometric information. Um, so, so to break that down, like why is that important? It's the missing layer uh, of AI uh, in terms of being able to take real world actions in an auditable, safe way. So, so crypto and DLT is the trust layer of our digital lives. AI, we're, we're having an enormous time trusting it. There's, there's this trust gap in AI. When we put the two together, that's where we're able to unlock uh, this, this sense of uh, digital abundance that has been foretold for the last several decades, but always seems just a little bit out of reach. Uh, as these things mesh, that, that's really sort of the technological singularity. Uh, people that are big AI fans won't like me calling anything a singularity because that has a very specific reference, but that, that's when we begin to see a lot of uh, cost savings and, and whether those are passed on to the consumers or not is an open question. This is a, this is a piece of regulation that we need to understand. At the moment, these phenomenon in your to the benefit of massive corporates and they're, they are integrating these things as quickly and aggressively as they can, whether they pass those savings along. I and mean, if you're a for-profit company, you have a fiduciary duty to your shareholders. And as a director of that entity, you're looking to maximize those profits. So why would you pass on these savings that, that you're seeing? So that that's where a policy framework becomes very important to, to look at this from a human centric standpoint. And how do we create the most human flourishing, the most human abundance using these tech tools that are now at our disposal? And how do we also prevent some sort of dystopian nightmare uh, that, that is also enabled by a lot of these tools, particularly AI? And I think blockchain is a central component of that. And it's, that's a lot of why Orbu was created. And so mm -hmm. there's a prediction market component to Orbu, which is the front end, but the back end of what we're really accomplishing with this uh, is an AI ethical safety database. And that's, that's its own whole podcast, which I uh, love, love to break that down in, in granular detail as well. Well, we will uh, link to Orbu in the show notes. Um, I think that knowing that people are looking to solve some of these inherent challenges that come with the technology is very promising. Um, and I think it, when some of these tools are created and adopted, it might maybe could help deal with some of these other challenges that we have with regulators, for example, like if there are tools in place to help understand, um, you know, how, how data is a being created and distributed and and how it's being used um i think that matters so i think you guys are doing great work and i would love to have that conversation where we can dive deeper into that we have referenced in our conversation today a little bit about sustainability and i know we don't have a lot of time um but since we're on the topic of sort of some of this technology for good um you know i think Blockchain technology in way of cryptocurrencies and NFTs have um, had received like pretty bad narrative around their environmental impacts for a variety of and some very valid reasons. Although we've seen 
uh, major evolution in some of these technologies over the last several years. Ethereum, as an example, reducing its carbon footprint by 99.9% when it moved from proof of work to proof of stake. I'm still getting the yeah. language right. Um, you nailed it. And so that being said, we know there's other things happening um, related to sustainability and, and some of the good work that this technology can do. Can you give us just a general overview? And if our audience thinks it's interesting, we'll make sure to dive even deeper uh, in definitely, another episode. Definitely. Yeah. So I actually got into a bit of a heated debate at the OECD on this very topic, which is actually kind of rare at, in these large convenience. They're, they're usually quite uh, polite, and, but I, I was... Uh, I was rather annoyed at, at a, the, an OECD conference last year when this point was brought up and, and the bit, Bitcoin's carbon footprint was uh, bandied about uh, without any comparison to what the traditional financial system requires to function. So, yes, Bitcoin, uh, we, we can measure the value of Bitcoin by how much energy it, it creates to produce. That's that's a fact. And it, and it definitely requires a lot of energy. Um, I'm personally a part of initiatives that, that use renewables for mining. Uh, all, all of that squares nicely and, and I'm at peace with it. And, I, and without getting hyper-political on whether you're on one side or the other of, of this issue, the, the fundamental point is that Bitcoin burns a lot of energy. It, it absolutely does. And that's actually one way to come up with a value of, of a Bitcoin is how much energy it's taking uh, to, to power this network and to secure it. Now, when we juxtapose that with the current financial system, with all of its legacy costs, uh, physical buildings, uh, massive infrastructure, employees, each of their carbon footprints, just to run that, it, it's, it's minuscule in comparison. And the amount of value, it's actually hyper-efficient in comparison. And the amount of value that can be anchored onto the Bitcoin network is enormous. It's, it's the, so, some estimates say that using things like the Lightning Network we could anchor uh, all of the world's value just onto the Bitcoin blockchain. It's like we have the equivalent of a tricycle uh, parked inside of this enormous Fort Knox style vault. So in, in short, um, Bitcoin burns an enormous amount of energy. That is true. But when compared to the number of transactions and, and what it can facilitate, a very strong argument can be made that it's actually... Uh, a safer alternative than legacy financial systems. Uh, and then, you know, we, we get into an entire philosophical debate on the merits of Bitcoin versus not. If you're not into Bitcoin, there are dozens of other really compelling solutions that are fully deployed now as well that have, uh, that are effectively carbon neutral. So when we talk about a firm like Hedera, uh, their HBAR it moves, it's a DLT, so it's not, it's not blockchain, it's DLT, um, but it, it moves uh, faster than a blockchain transaction and at, effectively for free. Mm -hmm. um, so those types of systems become incredibly empowering and, and super important when we talk about things like global foreign exchange and how to, how to smooth out uh, the, the rough edges around Forex, around remittances globally for impoverished countries, on and on. So there, there are definitely eco-friendly solutions uh, if that's the, the primary motivation. But I, I tend to fall on the side of Bitcoin as a social good and legacy banking has all sorts of inherent costs that don't actually need to be there that are, that are rubbed out when, when we're dealing with e Bitcoin as a base case and then other solutions that, that can be compelling for different use cases. Um, in terms of other compelling environmental initiatives, one of, the, one of the most troubling things that we watch right now is this phenomenon of greenwashing, where something appears to be an ESG uh, viable candidate and, and really isn't. And blockchain is a perfect solution uh, to those kinds of conversations. So there, there are a few initiatives out there uh, that, that look to uh, take carbon assets, uh, carbon credits, uh, carbon offsets, etc., and register them on chain so that the trading, so that both the provenance of the offset itself and the trading of that uh, offset or credit uh, is, is dramatically enhanced. So similar to what we saw with the NFT boom, this, this is a, a good 
the, the the NFT thing was fascinating for a lot of reasons, but it, as a use case for what's possible on chain, it was really a compelling uh, a compelling thing. Now the you know, prices and uh, and supply demand got got very strange and exciting, but with really boring use cases like supply chains or the trading of carbon credits, they're they're very ironclad use cases. Uh, that that make a ton of sense. That are that are perfect uses for the tech. Yeah, I think that's um, a topic I'd like to dive a bit deeper into and better understand and and help people understand. You know how those mechanisms work um, and recognize that they're likely going to be, you know, incorporated into our future and our businesses. Mm-hmm. Um, Maybe I can ask you just a random one question about, do, do you see, and I realize you've said you're not a predictor. Can you imagine in 10 years, an industry or sector where like blockchain type technology and AI that will not be touched by these technologies in a significant way? I can't. I mean, it it, it impacts every part of our, every part of the human experience. Uh, and the, the modern human experience uh, mm-hmm. will be impacted in some way by these technologies. AI is the scarier one in a lot of ways, and that's why there's this pressing need to understand the the overlap between AI and DLT and how you can use them to complement one another to make them both better. So mm-hmm. in healthcare, we see very profound examples of, of that already. Uh, we'll see it in financial services. We'll see it in voting. And we're, we're really at the precipice at the moment of really understanding what the regulatory response should be uh, versus what it is and how to facilitate uh, the, the good aspects and, and try to mitigate against the bad one. And, you know, it's, it's not it's far from over is the short answer. We things like the blockchain policy recommendation and the AI policy principles, when you read them together, that's. That is a framework for Web3, um, and that, that's a good place. And so a lot of the work that Cyrus and I are doing right now is synthesizing those two and then having conversations with uh, thought leaders that have, that have crossed over between the two. So guys like uh, Sandy Pentland is a really interesting one. He's, he's an MIT professor, and he sat on both the blockchain policy recommendation uh, group as well as the AI policy principle group. So. There, there's a lot of work that's being done there, but it's still uh, amorphous. It's not, it's not accessible enough, and and it's not immediate enough uh, to the the common uh, voter to understand what these policies, what the impact of these policies really is. And it's mm-hmm. to me, it's the difference between having sovereignty over things like your medical data and being able to control that and even you know benefit from it, monetize it. In, in a safe way versus turning that over to the major providers and, and letting them continue to benefit from your data. So mm-hmm. that's, I think that's the, the best real world use case that's the most immediate, particularly with our aging population, revolves around this intersection of uh, the, the tokenization and shareability of our health data and, and then the precision medicine aspects that come into that using sophisticated AI uh, to diagnose things well before they manifest and, and really expand human flourishing, drive down costs, uh, make make life better. And that's that's what this should be focused on, not the the nefarious elements that that maybe are uh, trying to dodge uh, KYC checks. So there's mm-hmm. and we, we talked about this briefly, but it really is kind of the most powerful element that has yet to be fully deployed and developed. And that's digital identity. So self-sovereign identity on chain, if somebody can figure out how to do that at scale and get the adoption, and I work at that from the policy side, innovators work at that from the tech side, there have been many attempts, but that that's the core of how we would have the ability to freely transact with our data uh, without these elements of social control that are so troubling to many, for good reason, right? There's There's... There's reason to be scared, for sure. There's also plenty of reason to be optimistic. I think it's the purpose of a podcast like yours to really get to engage and 
have, have these conversations in, a, in an informal way where we get to just really think about the implications of these things and then and then maybe spur some further reading and further thought. And, that, you know, hopefully this is the first of a, a few uh, sessions with you because I think you, you're you really asking the right question. Well, I really appreciate your time today, Benjamin. This has been very insightful, um, learning a lot. And as I said, I'm having some aha moments as I'm going through uh, some of the resources and, and referenced work um, that you're affiliated with. So I, I want to thank you. I will also um, put links in, in the show notes to uh, Benjamin and his LinkedIn profile, his, his, I still say Twitter because I feel like when you say X, people aren't quite <laughs> relating. We'll make sure to also link to um, some of your projects like orbu.ai so people can learn more. Well, uh, I really appreciate it, Benjamin. This has been great. I do hope we have further conversations. Everyone listening, thank you so much for tuning in. We will see you again next week. Thank you so much for tuning in to this week's episode of From the Blockchain. I really hope you enjoyed the show. If you have any ideas about future episodes, including themes or potential guests, please check for a link in the show notes. Happy to hear from you. Also, if you're interested in being a potential sponsor for From the Blockchain, I'd love to hear from you as well. Check for a special link just for you in the show notes. All right, everybody. Again, thanks for being here. Love the show. Love being with you. Please remember to subscribe, review, and share with your friends. Until next week, have a great one.